Welcome back to The Roundtable. I'm Katie Britton. Here in the Northeast, we're gearing up for the ultimate showdown between the Patriots and Giants as they go helmet to helmet in the Super Bowl this Sunday. For many, it's about Tom Brady reclaiming the missed glory from four years ago, while for others, it's about Eli Manning defending the Super Bowl champion title. And still for others, like myself, it's about the awesome food we've prepared for the big game. Joining us today is Keith Wallace, the author of Corked and Forked, Four Seasons of Eats and Drinks. He's got some amazing recipes that'll get us through the game and beyond. Now, if you don't remember the name, you might remember the voice. Wallace was a longtime host for WBUR's Morning Edition. That's <laughs> actually a long, long time ago, yes. Uh, you know, I loved working for BUR. I loved working for NPR, but that was a, a long time ago, and... Oh, you know, a lot's happened since. A lot has happened since. (laughs) And it brings us to food and drinking. So what is eating and cooking food to you? Oh, my. Well, it's actually my, it's what I do. I mean, it's scary, but I do it like 60 hours a week. Not actually eating and drinking, but, you know, I teach about food and wine and beverage and spirits. I mean, it's, it's my life. You know, it's everything I do now. I, um... I run the wine school of Philadelphia. I'm a former winemaker and actually a former chef, which along with having worked at BUR, you know, really, uh, and writing. And now I just kind of like write for and drink and eat food and make cocktails, you know, and I don't really have to work, I guess. I mean, some people call it work, but it's kind of just kind of fun now. Oh, it's the best when you find something that you love to do. Yeah, I, I I always thought that you know you you know it's always the truism you like you know don't do what you love you know like yes you know you'll end up hating it like that's actually something I uh, when I was a chef you know you really kind of learn to hate food you know and and cooking because you do it so long and so hard but now it's kind of funny teaching about it and writing about it and actually you know and the fact that I can uh, you know I just go to restaurants and write about food and drink wine and write about wine. Really, yeah, it's actually a pretty amazing job. I am a lucky, lucky guy. So all too often we get cookbooks that contain recipes that either consume too much time or have ingredients that are so expensive we just can't use it, and it's a nice coffee table book. So how have you gotten around this with Corked and Forked? Oh, you know, well, first off, thank you for noticing that because, I mean, I really appreciate you seeing that I actually, because that was the core concept of writing the book, was I wanted to offer really interesting, innovative food, you know, it's takes on classics and things that haven't been done before, but to do it in a way that anybody can do it, first off, so making very straightforward, cutting away all these steps that you just don't need to do, and and there's always ingredients that you really don't need. So I tried to Bring it down to only things that you can buy in a grocery store pretty much anywhere in the United States. I think only once did I uh, break out of that parameter. I One time I called for truffle oil, which you, know, you can't find everywhere. But there was only one time in the entire book that I did that. And I actually had to fight with my publisher about this, actually, because, you know, when I, when I was writing this, when I gave them the manuscript... The first question they had for me was, well, what kind of salt are you using? And I'm like, what, what do you mean? She says, you just said salt. Like, everyone, all cookbook writers now use specialty salt. So which kind of specialty salt do you want, you know, do you want in all your recipes? I'm like, no, I want table salt. I want just <laughs> basics. So, like, they wouldn't let me just put salt. I had to actually change it to fine salt so it could be identifiable. But everybody, I mean, so this is a difficulty thing. And I actually was talking to a couple of their cookbook authors about this while I was going into the the editing phase, you know, uh, as they're asking me to change things and to actually add more steps to things. And I'm, and when I, you know, when I was asking other cookbook authors, you know, what is up? Why are they making, trying to make me make it more complicated when I've actually just made things so beautifully simple and elegant? And the answer, always the answer was, was that the assumption in the cookbook trade is people want more complicated recipes, so it makes them feel like they are actually accomplishing something, huh. which I thought was insane. I actually thought that was. I, I think that this is a common problem, like you know, in a lot of cookbooks, because of this assumption is made that people want to spend you know three hours, you know, making something that really 
you know, with a few different changes, you could do it in half an hour. You know? right. I, and I, I personally don't agree with that. I think that, you know, I know I'm not going to cook anything that's going to take more than half an hour. I'm not. And I assume most people are, are like me, you know, that if you can do it in 10 minutes, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, the best thing is being able to open up a cookbook and just say, oh, I'll make this tonight. And you don't have to go to the grocery store. Exactly. That's, you know, and that's actually really, I mean, that's really important. You know, being able to have certain key ingredients, having certain, and I, I'm the kind of cook who, you know, I'm going to have a few elemental knives, a few pots. I don't have a whole bunch of stuff. And I'm going to, that is all I assume that anyone else has. So any dish, right, you have the tools you need to make dinner, nothing elaborate. You're going to have whatever in your refrigerator, you know, you can probably utilize and make dinner. You you don't need to have, like, to go out and, like, get specialty ingredients. And that's, I think that's the key is, you know, usually... Whatever's in your refrigerator, you know, typically you can make dinner. Just, you know, having a few staples, like good olive oil, good pasta, you know, pretty much. You don't really need that much, you know, and you don't need to spend a lot to have make a good meal. And that's the key point. Mm. So when you're tasting and pairing the drinks with the food, and we're not just talking about wine pairings, what are you looking for palate-wise? Mm. Well, whatever I'm, I'm going to pair... Uh, food with either beer or wine or a cocktail. I'm looking for one of two things. I either want it to pair to complement, like so that if there's like flavors of, like say, herbaceous flavors like lavender in the food. Maybe I've used a little bit of, uh, you know, bouquet garnier. Maybe a little bit of uh, Earth Provence in like a lamb dish. Well, I will want the wine to actually imitate that, like having a little bit of lavender in the fl- smells in the wine, so that. There's this really pretty, you know, continuation of flavors. The other thing, possibly, that I'll actually do is contrast. So that, like, if I have something really, really, really spicy, you know, then I'm going to have one of contrasting bright, fresh, light flavors in either the wine or the beer to contrast that. So, you know, I'm going to do one or the other, depending. But the other key point is actually one of the other things that I, I did with this book, which actually I think is really important. Because you know, I come from training winemakers and sommeliers, and and these people, you know, the people, you know, at this very high level of wine experts that we train at the wine school, they're used to actually like pairing and having, you know, late vintages of very exquisite wines and blah blah blah. And a lot of wine books actually go with that model, like offering very 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 specific pairings. You know, to the point of actually vintage and producer and where it's from and all the, which is impossible, absolutely impossible. Because if you actually take a book on food and wine pairing and look at these wine pairings, you'll never find that bottle. It's impossible. You know, no matter how much money you're going to spend, you're not going to find that specific bottle. So what I, I did was actually I pared every pairing down to the most essential key point. And for the most part, that's actually for wine, it's where it's from the grape and where it's from. And those two things are key, not who made it, not what vintage it is, so that people can actually find the wines to pair with the meals, no matter where you are in this country. And the same goes for beer. I don't I don't ever point out what producer, but what style. So mm-hmm. if I want an English IPA with something, that's I won't recommend a specific producer because, the, of course, that changes depending on where you are, depending on what state you are. It depends on what city you're in what's available. So these are key points um, just to make things easy so you can actually enjoy this rather than, I didn't want to write a book that people look at and go, oh, he sounds really smart. You know, I wanted a book that people could say, oh, this is accessible. I can do this. I can go pick up that bottle of wine you know, down the street. I can make this. I can go to the grocery store and I'll be, and pick up ingredients and, and it'll be this big you know, four-course meal and it'll take me less than, you know, less than four hours to put it all together and I'm going to seem like a rock star. That's what I wanted. I want people to actually eat and drink. I don't want people to read it and think I'm, you know, like, ooh, look at this. Keith Wallace is such a smart guy. I really want people just to enjoy it. I want this to be this the messiest, dirtiest cookbook in people's collection. That's what I want. I want porn pages. I want, you know, I want, like, pages that are burnt, comments in it, you know, say, this is fantastic, this is awful. And, you know, I, you know I, that's what I want. I want people to be involved with this book not to put it up on a pedestal. And that's, that's really my, from the very beginning, what I wanted. 
So let's get to the recipes. And yeah. I'd have to say easy noshing are the crispy chickpeas. Oh, the crispy chickpeas. Oh, yes. Oh, that's fun. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> the crispy chickpeas, that was such a fun thing. Yeah, such a, cause this was actually something I paired with. Uh, this is uh, my pairing from, with ceviche. Mm. Yeah, because this was actually instead of uh, traditionally uh, you would pair popcorn with ceviche. Uh, but the crispy chickpeas, because I just love these things. I uh, I don't know where I first had them, or if I it might have been something I made by mistake. Because I actually oftentimes uh, how I create recipes is I, I was intending to make something else, and I actually totally mess it up, and then I find that the uh, final product is actually better than what I intended. <laughs> I think this was one of them. I think it was actually trying to make a like a sort of a roasted, like a pan roasted something or other with chickpeas, and they ended oh. up being really like too crispy <laughs> but they were really delicious <laughs> and if we don't like curry we can heat it up with maybe some smoked paprika and chili powder and kind of have like a western oh, absolutely. style absolutely oh absolutely you know because you know because so, curry powders and i'm just thinking like a big you know, like a basic because that's a very has a lot of turmeric in it and so if, yeah if you're not yeah you know a little paprika fantastic you know it's, but it's a very very simple like noshy thing it's the kind of thing, you know, instead of, like, having chips, like, you you know, what, watching TV, you know, nausea, you will, they're delicious, and they're so fun. They're very addictive, though. They are, <laughs> you'll you eat a bowl of them, and you're like, oh, oh I just eat a bowl of chickpeas. <laughs> you, know? you can overconsume that pretty easily. <laughs> On the opposite side, you, there's the soy hummus, and it's a cool variation oh, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's kind of funny because I, you know, I, the soy hummus, as I, my wife is actually a vegetarian, and even though I am this huge, as you tell me the book, I'm, you know, I love cooking meat and eat a lot of meat, but I also like to have making variations, and I love edamame. I love, you know, soybeans, like baby soybeans are delicious. And it just, I wanted to make a variation of hummus, and adding this, it was just such, it adds a um, this real wonderful freshness and bright flavor to hummus instead of you you know instead of using your typical chickpeas it's just or other bean really it's remarkable um it's and also very addictive i uh you know i'm not a fan of hummus for for the most part i mean i've eaten <laughs> too much of it at at uh you know at at art openings and you know bad parties but this oh it just it just it just makes me happy that was a dish that you know i'll just and it's easy to whip up you know just using whether it's you know for, you know frozen edamame or whatnot but it's delicious as you can tell, I'm going with finger foods because yes, the Super Bowl is coming up and you have to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. No. Totally get it. Totally get it. <laughs> and then on the sweet side, you have the maple and bourbon bacon. We always call this pig candy. Oh, yes. I, you know, it is pig candy. Oh, it really is. And, you know, and if I could have called it that in the book, I would have. <laughs> this, was, this is so delicious. Um, it's so simple. The hardest thing about making this, you know, is because you're you're really taking, turning, you know, the maple syrup into, you know, you're heating it up, point of actually making it into candy, with the bacon. But the difficult thing here is not to like if you if you and even splatters, it will burn you. It will burn bad. So you know, <laughs> and that was actually uh, doing experiments, you know, like coming up with uh, the recipes. Yeah, this was this was one recipe where I. Uh, yeah, I, I I burned myself pretty bad on that one. It was, okay. however, the final product absolutely so delicious. I forgot, how, you know, that that second degree burn I had on my on my thumb. But uh, yeah, yeah, oh, it is. Oh, yeah, I'm glad you picked that one out. That's that was one of the last additions to the book, and because I am not a baker, and you know, so I had to every everything I um a lot of the recipes only take me a very short time to actually create, but bacon candy. You know, or anything, you know, was took me forever. Because anything that has to do with baking or, like, dessert takes me forever to figure out the measurements because I don't cook like that, typically. I actually am a very, like, by-the-hip kind of chef. Because that's, a, you know, after having been a chef, I was actually in the restaurants for about 10 years. as executive chef for five. And after that, having to cook the same thing over and over again... My belief is actually I rarely cook the same thing twice anymore, and I cook pretty much like five times a week. But baking things is always a difficult thing for me. It's it's not it is not my superpower by by any stretch of the imagination. 
But yeah, every cook, everyone who cooks is either you're a good baker or you're a good cook, um, and usually not both. If someone's both, then that they, that is that is a that is a rare a rare occurrence. I have to say, you have a wonderful brunch section in here, and while we thank you, <laughs> yes, thank you. I was sucker for brunch because I love the sweet and the savory, tantalizing our yeah. tongues, and you just you know <laughs> it's so much more than, than just eggs and locks. And I have to have to say, what's brunch without Bloody Marys? And to see you have oh, a Bloody yes. Mary bar. Well, yeah, exactly. And you know, and you know, and you have to realize that pretty much like all like cause everything. The whole book is set up on like dinners and parties and events, so that like you know, like and it covers like each like little chapter covers like one event. You know, whether it's Valentine's Day or something. But this one, I love this. Actually, my editor looked at this and like looked at this chapter on. You know, for the uh, the brunch, you know, it's just like this just doesn't make any sense. How are people going to do this? I'm like, no, trust me, people are going to love this because I actually did this. This was actually uh, a party that I had at my house, and yeah, it is super fun having that Bloody Mary bar and like fresh horseradish and pepperoncinis and you know, and having <laughs> vodka. I'm actually not a big vodka drinker. I think vodka has you know doesn't taste like anything. I like my booze to taste like things, but for breakfast, oh, bloody. <laughs> yeah, next time I'll invite you next time I have it because it's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun having 10, 15 of your closest friends over for brunch. It's a hoot. Mm. It is a hoot. I'm a big fan of the giant green olives in my bloodies. Oh, yes, yes. Those actually, and it, yeah, uh, have you ever had like those uh, tomatoes, like the baby t- tomatoes that have actually been cured like an olive? Those are delicious too. No. Oh, that'll have yeah. to be this weekend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a sucker for that. I'm also, because I am originally from New England. I live in Philadelphia now, but I was born and raised actually outside of Boston, uh, actually in this town that everyone knows, Salem, Massachusetts. So I'm a sucker for Clamato, you know, which I don't mm. think anybody except people in New England and a little bit in New York actually know, but... uh yeah, so I, I still like a little bit of uh, my breakfast. I like it. I, I do like a uh, little clam juice in my um, bloody still. So Ooh. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not for the faint of heart. I don't. I, I don't suggest it for everybody. But you know, it is my. Uh, it's one of my things I love. <laughs> now we can't leave you without talking about your recipe for the ultimate veggie stock because it is so interesting to me that it has soy sauce in it. Oh, thank you, thank you. You know, you're hitting some of these things that. Um, you know, that are really actually dear to my heart, which is kind of funny because these aren't the usual things that people want to talk about. And I really love that because the, this stock, it is, this is I'm one of the most proud of. Cause it was, it took a lot of thought and it's actually, there's a lot of, uh, actually a lot of uh, theory involved in that and understanding, um, you know, how food tastes and why it tastes like it does at a molecular level. But I did it specifically because you know, my wife, my girlfriend at the time of me, my writing, and it's actually, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's who it's dedicated to, Alana, which, you know, vegetarian, and so, it's, which is difficult for me to cook for, because a lot of my classical training involves around using really rich flavors that you can't really get oftentimes in vegetarian food. So this vegetarian stock is, is how I developed to get that stock to get really rich, really intense, rich meaty flavors without using any sort of meat. So I can use this as a base for any sort of meal that I want to use veal stock for or beef stock or, you know, demi glace. Mm. So things like why this por- the porcinis, um, the tomato, like the costa tomato, and the soy sauce are all because they all have a lot of glutamates. These are really intense, rich flavor profiles that actually give a, the sensation of meatiness on your palate. You may not even know it, but yeah, these are the elements that actually really bring that together. And so layering all of these on top of each other really gives it that intense, rich, decadent flavor that you typically only get with something that involves meat, you know, um, you know, veal bones or, you know, veal marrow. But this is actually uh, without any of that. And it's, it's one of my, it's my pride and joy in the book. I, I always have this on hand so that I can make, you know, any sort of dish that would, you know, otherwise would require veal stock. 
including soups, and you can't tell the difference. It's really, 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 really rich and savory. But thank you for pointing that out. I'm sure everybody will love to go home and make this stock recipe. The name of the book is Court and Fort. Keith, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Again, the name of Keith Wallace's cookbook is Corked and Forked, Four Seasons of Eats and Drinks. It is published by Running Press. For The Roundtable, I'm Katie Britton.